Thank you, Anthem Trio. Really appreciate you guys. Uh, not just your singing, but just who you are and uh, your, your heart for the Lord. I think you got a, a glimpse of that today. Amen, church? I mentioned last Sunday, we want to help support their ability to travel to places like ourselves. Um, I don't know if you've recognized this, but gas prices are kind of crazy these days. Um, and if you see what they're driving, it's, they're not driving a Prius, okay? Um, Prius wouldn't fit all their, <laughs> all their stuff for one thing. Um, so we want to at least help like cover their gas to get here and to the next stop, like, and be a blessing to the, the school. And so if you haven't already, if the Lord uh, leads you to, to just drop something in the offering plates after the service, uh, that would be great. Just, just make sure you mark KNBC on the memo line or put it in, in an envelope and mark KNBC. We'll make sure that that goes together. We'll give them one check from the church to take back to the university. Um, just our way of saying thanks for, for serving, but also to kind of pay it forward and help them to continue to serve in other places. Well, hopefully you have your Bibles today. If not, uh, grab a Bible from there in front of you. We're going to go and take a look at John chapter 15 as we continue to walk through the gospel according to John. Going to do a little mini-series today based on chapter 15 today and next Sunday. So first section today and then the second section next Sunday entitled Love and Hate. Jesus, for those of you that have been with us, you'll remember uh, he's in the, it's the last night in less than 24 hours, Jesus will be hanging on a cross. So you can imagine the weight of the conversation that is taking place in this moment. We've looked at some of the conversation that Jesus had with his disciples surrounding the Last Supper and so forth and talking about the, the gift, the Holy Spirit. And we looked at that last week and the, actually the last two weeks. But as we look at love and hate, we, I see that Jesus was just lovingly and beautifully getting ahead of where the disciples were going to be going. They were going to be going into some very difficult waters to have to navigate through. Life was going to be incredibly hard for them. And they needed to know how to navigate these, these twists and turns that are going to be coming their way. And that there was going to be love and there was going to be hate. And the understanding that Jesus was helping them to go forward with is critical for them. And I believe critical for us that we have this foundation of love, first of all, that we'll look at today. And then second, next week, we'll look at how to deal with hate. Have you noticed there's a lot of hate in the world? Jesus told the disciples, basically, don't be surprised. You're going to be hated. Two words that we look at, love and hate. And when you see these words, these words of emotion, they, they, they stir up emotion, right? How does it make you feel when you hear the word love or especially to know that you are loved? What comes to mind? What, like, that gives peace, that gives joy, that like, wow, I, I, can, I can just rest in that, right? We all want to be loved. Second thing, though, is dealing with hatred. How does that make you feel when somebody says, I hate you? Or you find out from somebody else that somebody hates you. Like, what did I do? And I got to make things right. And sometimes there is no making things right to stop the hate. And we'll look at that next week and how to be okay with people hating us. Because if we're living the way that we're supposed to live, probably going to have some people hate us and we're going to have to be okay with that and so we'll look at what jesus said to the disciples about that next week today i want to focus in on love and talk about the grapes of love jesus gives us a great passage here a very visual illustration that he shares with the disciples and he's looking at three things three things that we all wrestle with three things that 
possibly keep you up at night. Three things that, that either make life full or, or leave us feeling super empty. Identity, security, and impact. Does my life really make a difference? Does my life have purpose? We all want to know, who am I? Our identity. We all want to know, am I loved? Security. And I think we all want to know, how can I make a difference? How do I make my life count? Jesus is going to give the disciples the answer to all three of those questions. And in a nutshell, the big idea, here's where we're going. Here's what Jesus wants the disciples to know. True fruit comes from a true relationship with the true vine. True fruit, lasting impact, making a difference, not just for today, but for eternity. The fruit, true fruit, what most of us are looking for. We want to make a difference. We want to make our life count. Well, how do we? A lot of times people just go after that without having the foundation settled, the security and the identity, because true fruit comes from a true relationship with the true vine. John chapter 15, verse 1. Let's walk our way through this. Jesus says, I am the true vine. What kind of vine? True. I'm going to pause there because this is foundational to what everything Jesus is going to be say or saying. He, he gives a qualifier that talks about the quality of who he is. He's the true vine. In other words, there are other kind of vines, right? If he's the true vine, then there are false vines. There are vines that don't live up to the quantity or the quality of what Christ provides. And in many ways, as Jesus is speaking, it's important to keep in mind that Jesus is speaking to those that were Jews. Those that knew their Old Testament. Those that took great confidence and found their identity in their nationality. We're Jews. And so when Jesus says, I am the true vine, they're picking up on things and saying, okay, wait a minute. We know that scripture says, if we go back and we look at Psalm 80, we look at Isaiah 5, we look at Jeremiah 2, we look, look at Ezekiel chapter 15 and 19, we look at Hosea 10, that God's word, the prophets particularly talked about Israel being the vine, but they were a degenerate vine. They were a vine that had gone off the rails. They were a vine that wasn't living up to what God had created them for. They weren't being the true vine. And Jesus comes in contrast and says he's the true vine. And then he says, and my father is the gardener. And so he's painting a picture for the disciples. And most likely they had left the upper room and they were actually walking amongst the vineyard in the Mount of Olives. And you can just imagine Jesus pointing to the, the, the grapes and the, the vines as he's explaining and giving them this visual illustration. Verse 2, he says, He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. Verse 3, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. This is very similar language to what we saw or what you can see if you go back and you look at when Jesus washed the disciples' feet. And Peter at first says, no, don't, you're not touching my feet, which I, like I told you then, I can understand that. I don't want other people touching my feet. Peter didn't want to let Jesus serve him. And Jesus said, well, unless I wash your feet, you have no part with me. And then Peter's like, well, then wash all of me. Like, I'm all in. And what did Jesus reply? 
I don't, you don't need to be washed. You're clean, just your feet are not clean. You've been walking in the dirt. You've, you've been made clean. You just need your feet to be clean. Okay? Don't need to be completely washed. And so Jesus is telling the disciples, you've, you've been washed. So no branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. You're going to get this idea that Jesus really wants us to remain. Another word that some of you may see as you're following along is the word abide, which I actually like the word abide a little better than I like the word remain. But both words work pretty well. We'll come back to that idea as we continue on. Verse 5. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Here we go. Identity. Jesus is the vine, we are the what? Branches. Our identity flows from the vine, the true vine. Who you are directly flows from whose you are. Jesus begins by saying, I am the vine. If you want to know who you are, it's important to know who you are not. So Jesus begins by saying, I am the vine. Okay, well then, if he's the vine, guess what that means? We are not the vine. And in this illustration, the vine is the source of life. The, the vine is is the, the end-all, be-all. And sometimes people get things twisted and think they're the end-all, be-all. They're the one who decides life, the one that gives life. And we see from Scripture that he is the author and perfecter of life. That's why abortion is a really big issue in my eyes. Because abortion and many other things get things twisted and we think that we are somebody that we're not. It comes back to identity. The first part of knowing who you are is knowing who you are not. We're not God. We don't get to make certain decisions. He says, you, I am the vine, you are the branches. And people often look, and we think of identity, people often look at what they do to indicate their identity. Well, who are you? Well, I'm a teacher, or I'm a lawyer, or I'm a pastor, or I'm this, or I'm that. Or, or they look to, like, what they enjoy doing. Well, I'm a, I'm, I'm a jock, I'm an athlete. What I'm good at, uh, things that we look at. Our, our financial situation, that's my identity. What can happen to all of those things? They can be gone like that, right? Some of you, you've lost a job before like that. And with that financial security, potentially. Even just going through this last year or more, financial security isn't what it used to be for many different individuals. As I get older in life, athletic ability isn't, what it used to be. Can I get an amen? <laughs> and too often we place our identity in what we can do. And we think who we are is directly connected to what we do. And I think Jesus wants us to understand something much different than that. And sadly, one of the most ways that people are beginning to identify themselves is their sin. My identity is my sin. And so if you question my sin or point out my sin, then you're attacking the very core of who I am, my identity. But if we are in Christ, our, our sin is not our identity. And Jesus is gonna talk more about obedience and our identity as we continue. It says, if you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire, and burned. 
So before we go into the four kinds of lives that we can live, I, I want you to fill in the blank. Jesus says, apart from me, you can do... Okay, two people were listening. That that's good. Let's try. Let's try it again. Maybe it'll wear up. You know, kind of help others. Apart from me, you can do nothing. nothing. Okay, is Jesus saying apart from Him we can't do anything? Well, He said nothing. He is the giver of life. He does sustain us. I, I do think there's certainly a, some truth to, apart from him, we can do nothing. But especially when it comes to lasting fruit, really making a difference in this world, apart from him, we can do nothing. In this illustration, Jesus gives four different kinds of lives that people live. Let's walk through them very quickly. Their first life is the fruitless life. The fruitless life. It's empty. Now there are two different kinds of people that live a fruitless life, not really making an eternal impact. Jesus begins by saying, talking about those that are in him that bear no fruit. And the translation that I read says, he cuts them off. Now, it's possible that that translation isn't the best translation, particularly when it comes to explaining, describing what happens to those that are in Christ that don't bear fruit. It's possible in some translations, some even in the NIV, which I read from, will have notes. Some, some Bibles will have a, a little note that says it can also mean to lift up. And I think that's a, a much better understanding of the word that's used there in that particular verse, in verse 2. That as the gardener, as the vine dresser, Jesus lifts up the branch and cleans it off. I, I recommend a book in the teaching notes called The Secrets of the Vine by Bruce Wilkinson. In that, he shares of a time where he was on a speaking engagement and ends up having a meal with a vineyard gardener, uh, a vine dresser, and they're talking about John chapter 15. And he, the, the vineyard dresser, the vine dresser, asks him if he understands it. And, and so they're talking through, and, and he shares his understanding of the branch that bears no fruit. That's just cut off. He says, well... This tiny branch, the early branches, young branches, oftentimes they don't have all the strength that they need. And so it's easy for them to kind of get trampled on, easy for them to start sagging. They get muddy. They need it lifted up, cleaned off, brushed up, and, and kind of supported. And then they're great and they will bear fruit for you. You don't cut those off. They're much too valuable. And I think one of the keys that we have provided for us in this verse is that Jesus says those that are in him, they're in him, but they're not bearing fruit right now. And I think sometimes in life, things happen. We get trampled on. Life just kind of gets messy. And it's hard to bear fruit. And we need Christ to come along we need the Lord to lift us up, kind of brush us off, give us some support so that we can bear fruit. Perhaps you're not bearing fruit today, not lasting fruit, because you've just really been beat up. Today, the Lord wants to encourage you. The Lord wants to dust you off clean you up. For some, that cleaning off might involve sin that needs to be confessed. And you're not producing fruit because you've been living in sin. The dirt that's got you down isn't the dirt that somebody else has kicked on you. It's the dirt that you created for yourself. Your own sin. 
and you need Christ's forgiveness and you need to turn to him and allow him to forgive you and to lift you up. But then there's another kind of fruitless life and we see that in verse 5. Those are the ones that are just disconnected. They're not remaining in Christ. They're not abiding in Christ. They're not walking with Christ. They're not saved. They're not in Christ. To be in Christ means we're saved. We're a Christian, and there's no way that we can bear fruit if we're not in Christ. So that kind of life is just useless. Those are thrown away for the fire. It's not going to amount to anything because you're not connected to the vine. It's empty. But that's not what Jesus wants for us, right? I mean, who wants, who wants to live that kind of life, right? Jesus wants to see us have more fruit. The, the gardener, the Lord, wants us to have more fruit. And so what does he do? The, the gardener comes and he prunes. He trims away. How many of you have trimmed trees before, or trimmed shrubs before? And, and those that really understand it, and I'm not saying that I do, but I've done some reading understand, particularly when it comes to the fruit that grows on a vine, especially grapes, that they grow best when you cut back the excess. That grape vines allowed on their own to just ro- go and, and, and grow, they'll, they'll grow all right. They'll spread out in every kind of direction, and you'll see a lot of beautiful green leaves. You might see some thick branches but you'll see very few grapes. Because all of the energy, all of the effort is pushed into other things besides the fruit. The same is true oftentimes in our Christian lives. Right? How much energy, how much time, how much money gets put into things that have no eternal value. Gets put into things that will have no eternal impact on the lives around us. And so what does the gardener do? The gardener comes into our life and says, let's cut this back. Let's, let's refocus your energy. Let's refocus your time. Let's prioritize your finances a little better. Sometimes that pruning involves sin. Oftentimes the pruning involves getting rid of good things so that we can go after the best things. Things that aren't really true fruit so we can go after what God really has for us. God wants more than just more fruit for us to be fruitful. He, he wants he, he wants. He wants more fruit. I mean, he wants, he wants more fruit, right? And that's that's the, the whole goal of the pruning. Pruning hurts sometimes. Having things cut away, things that we maybe even enjoy doing, that can hurt. But it's also that we can experience the fruitful life that God has for us. And that, so we can make a difference in the lives of others. But God doesn't even want us to just stop with more fruit. He wants us to experience much fruit. Full life. And really make an eternal difference in those around us. Four kinds of life. Empty, no grapes, no impact. There's grapes, there's some fruit, there's some impact, but it's limited. Need pruning. First one, they need lifted up. Might need forgiveness. Might need to be able to forgive. Help forgiving. Support, some strength. Pruning, let's cut away, let's trim. It continues to do that so that we can bear more fruit and even much fruit. Verse 7, 
If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. Now we've seen Jesus share some similar statements to this before, but I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. Jesus is not saying you can have a blank check. You can just pray whatever you want and you're going to get it. It's based on relationship. It's based on knowing who God is and what is for the Father's glory. I think this is all about praying for a fruitful life, praying for a life that makes an eternal difference. And as we do so, we'll show ourselves to be his disciples. Verse 9, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that, you're, so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. This is so good. We're his. We're his. We know who we are, and, and that flows from whose we are. Our identity is in him, and when our identity is in him, we begin to become more and more secure because we are then able to answer the question, am I loved? Am I loved? If we are in Christ, what's the answer? Absolutely, and we know that we are loved. But we also know that it's important to not let this relationship drift. And so Jesus continues to say, hey, remain in me, guys. Abide in me. Keep pressing in. I know the, the world's going to press in on you. You're going to feel the weight of the world. I love the song that they sang earlier. You're going to feel the weight of the world. And sometimes when we feel the weight of the world, what we start to think and when we start to feel is, well, God must not love me anymore. God must not like me. God must have given up on me. And so instead of pressing into God, when the world is pressing in on us, we pull away from God. And so Jesus is telling the disciples, don't do that. Press into me, remain in me, abide in me. Don't drift. Be intentional. Be intentional. You are loved. You are loved. You are loved. There are times when it may not feel like it, but know it. You are loved. Don't let the relationship drift. Seek time with him. Let me ask you, church, are you being intentional about your relationship with God? Are you being intentional about abiding in the true vine, devoting time with him? Because disconnection and disobedience interrupts the flow of joy. Verse 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. I, Jesus is here addressing the second question, right? Am I loved? <laughs> no love greater than this. I want you guys to know how much you're loved. And then he says, I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my Father, I have made known to you. I don't see Hank today. Hank's not here, is he? I, I love that guy. Some, some of you have heard him. Some of you have not. I, I love, some of you call me pastor, and that's great. And I, and I love the, you know, like, it's a special title to me. Um, it's a title of honor, and I don't take it lightly. And I appreciate the respect that is shown, um, and, and oftentimes the love. But Hank doesn't usually call me pastor. You know what Hank calls me? Friend. Hey, friend, how you doing today? I love friend. <laughs> that, like, makes, makes you feel good when somebody calls you friend. And we're not talking about, like, Facebook friend, right? I mean, anybody can be Facebook friends. I'm friends with people on Facebook that I don't really even know who they are. And I'm pretty sure they wouldn't do what Jesus just said. Call you friend because I'm going to lay my life down for you. Selfless friendship. I call you friend because I'm going I'm to tell you everything that the Father has told me. 
I'm going to share my life with you. I'm an open book before you. That's love. That's friendship. That's security. And he goes on to say, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. This is my command. Love each other. Who am I? I'm the branch. I've been chosen by the true vine. Who I am flows from whose I am. Am I loved? Absolutely. I've been chosen. Christ calls me friend. You know, people in the seats aren't the only ones that struggle with these three questions. Who am I? Am I loved? How do I make a difference? Pastors oftentimes struggle with that as well. This was made especially clear to me this last week. It was on a Zoom call with uh, a group of pastors that we get together um, at least once a month, sometimes twice a month during the school year anyway, it's twice a month. But we just got together um, for kind of a, a check-in that our, our leader wanted us to do. And one of the guys was sharing that he, he got away for a couple weeks. He said, I, I just needed just needed to kind of just breathe, relax. And I really, I just needed to spend some time with the Lord. I needed to, to hear from God. I was desperate to hear from God. So he set aside two weeks, went out to Colorado, and he was sharing on the Zoom call Thursday that he had been praying previous, Lord, Lord, I just, I need to hear from you. Been struggling with insecurities, just not feeling good enough, not feeling smart enough, not feeling like, like he had what it was needed to lead the church and, and just really feeling down. It's like, Lord, I just, I need to hear from you. So I'm going to get away and, and just spend some time with the Lord. So he hears of a place, you go up a, a mountainside and there's some kind of more remote camping spots and um, great place. Some of you have been out to Colorado and I'm like, there's something majestic about being in the mountains. And it just get away. And spend some time. And so he's, he's traveling up the mountain. And the farther up the mountain he goes, the more secluded it is. There's, there's f- fewer and fewer uh, campsites and everything. And, and he ends up putting it in four wheel drive because, I mean, again, he's going up a mountain and the train's not the best. But it's like, I just feel like I need to keep going up. And finally, he gets to kind of a, an opening and he sees this large boulder. And he said that the boulder reminded him of, of kind of just what he envisioned, like this time with God was going to be, and, and kind of this, this boulder that, that came to his mind. So not necessarily like exactly like he saw it in his, in his head, but, but it reminded him of that. And so he, he parked his vehicle and he gets out and he, he starts walking. He sees kind of this opening, this outcropping, and this the spot where he can look over and, and just look out and, and see God's creation, the beauty of what God had created. And as he's walking out and walking out a little farther, he says, I, something caught my attention. There was just a little thing that was blue. Like, what is that? Like, there's like nobody out here. What's going on? So he walks over and he bends down and he picks up a blue rock. And he held that blue rock as we were on that Zoom call together. And he showed us what it said, and it says, you are enough. Now, some people would look at that and go, oh, okay, well, I'm enough. I don't need the Lord. He, he knew better than that. He knew God was saying, in me, you are enough. Your identity and your security are in me. Not in how smart you are, not in how good you are, not in how well you can preach. The fruit will come. And I look forward, I'm expecting, I'm expecting to hear great things from my friend Scott. As we touch base in the coming weeks, months ahead, because something was settled deep within him. His identity and security, he needed reminded, he knew this. But he needed a reminder. And maybe some, day, some days, and maybe even today, you do as well. That true fruit comes from a true relationship with the true vine. Our identity and our security. When our identity is in the true vine. 
and we're walking in a true relationship with him, walking in obedience, walking in love, abiding in him, we will bear much fruit. The fruit will come. The fruit will come if we're abiding in him. As I close today, which one are you? Fruitless, need lifted up, need encouraged, maybe you need to confess sin because that's getting in the way of your relationship with the Lord. Maybe never entered into a relationship with the Lord. And today would be the day that you would receive salvation, gift of grace. You can't earn it. The fruit doesn't come before the relationship. The relationship comes before the fruit. So many people get it backwards. They think they can earn God's love. Jesus is very clear. I chose you. You didn't choose me. Some of us, we need to be pruned. There are things in our life, priorities in our life, that we've allowed to get out of whack. And it looks like life. It looks exciting. There's green. It's like, yeah, it looks good. But it's not really fruitful. Not fruit that lasts. Not fruit that really makes a difference for eternity. And the Lord says, how, how about we let, take a look at your schedule? How about we take a look at your pocketbook? Let's shave some things off here. Let's get rid of some stuff over here. Let's focus on things that will make more of a difference for eternity so that you can have even more fruit and much fruit. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you love us. Holy Spirit, I thank you that you are faithful to work in our lives as we saw the last couple weeks. And there's certainly no coincidence that this passage about remaining, abiding, and being fruitful falls right in between Jesus talking about your work in our lives and your work in our lives in chapter 14 and chapter 16. And so whether it's needing to be cleaned, lifted up, needing to be pruned, whatever the case may be, would you work in our lives in such a way that we would bear much fruit, understanding that much fruit brings glory to the Father, and I trust that that is our desire, Lord. So may we find our identity in Jesus Christ. May we find our security in Jesus Christ. And may we be fruitful. May we have great fruit for the name of Jesus Christ, that the Father would be glorified, that men and women, boys and girls would come to know you, would grow in you and serve you. Lord, help us to live lives that make a difference for your, for your kingdom, for your glory, I ask it. Amen. Well, thanks for coming. The Lord bless you. Be sure to stop by uh, the KNBC booth on your way out. Have a great week. The Lord loves you and so do I.